This twelfth talk is titled Is Allyship an Antidote to Racism and features Dr. Fatima Tresh, who is a psychologist and evidence based practitioner, and Dr. Omar Konkuo, who is an executive leadership coach and public speaker. Hello, good evening, and welcome, everyone. It's our twelfth session in the series of Resilience. Uh, my name is Ali Mahedi. I'm based in Scotland. You can see the scenery behind me. And during the day, I'm not a pediatric surgeon, of course, I do on course, but in my spare time, I'm a student at Warwick Business School. So I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of Omar Konkwe, based in London, a dental surgeon, and she will introduce herself later on, but also Matt Sewell, a spinal surgeon based in London. And uh, in the course of our event today, he'll also say a few words about himself. So this series was set up to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic to help professionals, especially in healthcare, understand the challenges in the work and the personal environment and to deal with these, not just cope. Because I mean, coping is a thing, it's a very passive thing, it's a very defensive thing, but we want people to actually understand what they're dealing with and how they can actually then um, try and understand what's happening around them and not just cope, but also uh, work towards making that change in their environment. So we set out with the premise that by understanding who we and others are and working together, this particular crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, would be an opportunity to build the future of the future we want. And that was a very nice phrase that was framed by one of our uh, earlier speakers, Catherine Pereira, director of NHS Horizons. So this is now the time for us to build the future of the future we want. So as most of you would know and have probably experienced that crisis is a time of opportunity. It's an opportunity for change. And most of you would know that during the crisis of World War II, the blueprint of the welfare state, the new Jerusalem, which was based on virtues like justice, compassion, honesty, that welfare state established. Now we find ourselves on a common ground in the COVID crisis. Each of us is very uncertain about our health and that of our dear ones. Yet there are issues such as death in the Bay of BA workforce and the recent events in America following the death of George Floyd. These events have proved very decisive. So just to give you a comparison, the Bank of England recently reported that our GDP, our gross domestic product, our economy dropped by 20 in the month of April. So as we emerge into recovery, which we are, lockdown is easy, it will be vital that each one of us is part of the recovery. So the statistics will show that 13% of the UK population is of black, Asian, or minority ethnic background. A huge chunk. So 13% of the UK population is of that background. 20% of the economy, which is thought to be catastrophic, has dropped. So 13%, in my view, would form a very significant number, which needs to contribute to the recovery. Just to give you a bit of context for those of you in healthcare, like myself, before the crisis, the Medical Council reported that nearly half of the medical workforce was on the word of, or were actually burnt out. They were wanting to leave their jobs or the NHS altogether. I'm very happy to share that document with you if you want. A large proportion of black, Asian, minority and ethnic doctors reported being discriminated against. The King's Fund and the GMC acknowledged that this representation in leadership roles of the black, Asian, minority ethnic community is lower in proportion to the workforce. So to give you the actual figures, 8% of executives out of 46% of that particular segment of the workforce, and then 16% of medical directors against a 46% Black Asian and minority ethnic workforce. So anyway, I'd like to say before we proceed and acknowledge that prejudice, which is prejudging people, things and events, it's there in all of us. It's, I see it as a barrier that keeps us in the comfort zones of how we perceive things, you know, especially the culture of work and the personal lives we live, it's our comfort zone. We prefer to actually remain that way and actually feel possibly threatened 
by a new way that's being introduced by another section. So, it is a well accepted fact that inclusive organizations and societies thrive. Exclusive cultures do not thrive in the long run. And I would say very proudly that what makes this country Great Britain is actually the welfare system started after the World War, after World War II, which was based on those values of equality. So, how can we be part of this recovery? On one side, organizations will need to be proactive in engaging their people and getting the most out of diversity that brings new ideas. But I think we have to do something ourselves. And to answer those questions, we have experts, Fatma Thresh, who will introduce herself, and our very own Omo Okonkwe to tell us more and answer these questions that you and us, we want to bring up. So, over to you, Omo. But before that, I'd like to tell all the participants to mute their mics. Um, and we'd like you to come on camera and raise your hand if you want to ask questions. And we'd be really grateful for your questions and opinion. Thank you very much. So, Omo. Thank you so much, Ali. Good evening, everyone. It's such a great um, joy to be with you today. Um, this is um, one of these highly interesting topic and very topical topics. So I just wanted to say um, this definitely is a safe space for you to really share your thoughts and opinions. We really do want to hear all your thoughts and opinions on that. Just to introduce myself, I am I'm, I was going to get everyone um, to please fill out um, our survey monkey, which will take one minute. I'd really, really be grateful if you could do that. That would be great use to us. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen um, and I will walk you through how that's going to, what that looks like. So if you go into the chat, chat box, you'll just see just before we start, um, you're going to see a link which will take you directly to SurveyMonkey. I just want to just encourage you to go ahead and um, do that, um, especially for those who've attended before. This is really vital um, information, really want to be able to be able to serve and provide the right um, programs for yourself. So the first question, how many sessions of the Vision Series have you attended? And it's fairly straightforward, what topics are you interested in? How did you hear about us? And what is your professional background? What's your age? What age category are you? And how would you rate the learning? Would you like us to have more sessions? And what would you like us to discuss further? So if you could, that's, that's um, really, really straightforward. Be grateful if you could go ahead and um, um, fill that in just as we open the slides, okay? So I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second and then bring you onto my, my presentation. Could it go, that's fine, and then. And screen share. Brilliant. Right, so the topic today is the new pandemic um, is allyship, the antidote to racism. So as I said, um, Ali has introduced me before, I'm a dental surgeon and a dentist. I've practiced in the NHS in various capacities for the last 15 years. I'm also an executive coach, leadership coach. My real interest is leadership, clinical leadership, and also um, especially to do with um, gender disparities. And one of the things I also like to do, look at is inclusion. So it's a great pleasure to have a look at this today and share some of my insights into the topic of allyship and is um, allyship in the workforce. So just before we go ahead, I thought it would be really interesting if we look at, um, look at this. Oh, sorry. Um, so there's a riddle that I want to share with you. A father and son are out driving and they have a car crash killing the father. An ambulance takes the badly injured son to the local hospital and in the operating theatre, the surgeon at the, um, at, says to the patients, I cannot operate on the patient, he is my son. So why did the surgeon say that? So, do you guys want to put some of your answers in the chat box? 
can't actually see the chat box. Where do I go to get the chat box? Technology. So you can read that yourself. Ali, any responses? Let me make sure I can see the chat box. Um, for some reason, I can't see the chat box. We have a lot of correct responses, are we? Sorry? We have a lot of correct responses. Oh, right. So I guess lots of people have seen this and probably I went aside um, a slide ahead. But yeah, well done if you, you know, you spotted that. Because there's always an assumption. Some people, oh, and I first heard this, if you haven't heard this, because a lot of people have actually done um, the unconscious bias training. When I heard this, I was like, oh my God, what, why could it be? Would it be, the grand, would it be a grandfather? And my thought never went to the surgeon being a mom. So this is just a classic example of gender bias. So well done if you got that right. And if you've done some um, bias, unconscious bias training, so you're probably well informed, but well done guys for that. I can't really see anyone for some reason, but let's crack on. So um, I just wanted to talk about bias in the format of understanding why we have our different bias. So we have two parts of our minds. We've got the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And what they all have different functions and I'm not going to go into it in great detail because I, 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 I just want to bring it into a very, very practical level. So we have lots and lots of information coming into our brain at every, every second. So they say something like 2 million bytes per second come into our brain through different sensories that we have. And in that way, we have to find a way to be able to filter this information. And so the way the brain works, um, we actually decide whether we're going to delete the information. We either generalize or distort the information. And the way we filter it is based on our beliefs, based on a set of values, values, beliefs, decisions, any memories we've had, our mood at the time, our language, and what our recognized identity is. So I'm just basically saying every time we meet people or anything, we basically decide, make our decisions within a few seconds. We either delete, we either generalize, and we distort. And the reason we do that is based on these things, meta programs, your values, your beliefs and um, decisions. And as I said, you have two minds, right? So the conscious mind, which basically operates 5% of the time of the day, and it's really the creative mind and your subconscious mind, which is your, which is operates 95% of what you do. And this is what the the subconscious mind, it really filters information. So you can actually respond quite quickly. And really, that's really one of the reasons. I mean, there's a lot greater detail in, to it, but this is just a very simple way of describing how you actually assess information. So in, base, in many ways, we're almost um, habitually actually making bias and it's just the way we actually survive. So that just, this is this, what that shows there. So the different kinds of bias, and I thought this was really interesting to look into, there's confirmation bias. So we basically, we see what we expect to see. So for example, you, you make, make an assumption or a generalization about a certain group of people when you immediately make them, um, meet them. That assumption is based on your, your filters, what, you, what your beliefs are, what your memories, if you've had any experience with these kind of people, you could be a positive or a negative and you just make an assumption based on that. Or you have an insider bias. So for example, you know, if, you, if you're interviewing somebody, for example, and the person is maybe from the same the same gender as you, or perhaps maybe from the same university as you, you think, oh yeah, that person is really good. I went to that university. So that kind of bias can come in. And attributional um, bias, um, basically that could be a positive or negative. For example, if you have a work colleague and maybe your manager doesn't particularly like them, and maybe the team succeeds, right? The, the team will succeed and the manager will say, well, um, it's because the team was very good. 
but if the same person, another person the manager likes, they will then say, actually, the reason they've succeeded is because they've got really good leadership style. So that's an explanation of attributional bias and overconfidence bias. Um, in many cases, we've probably seen that very lately um, when you're overconfident about your own abilities, um, not naming names. Um, but I know Germany wasn't overconfident. They kind of did very well in preparing and some other countries, unbeknownst to us, probably was a little bit more slow to acting because they're overconfident with their own um, um, abilities. So those are the different kinds of bias um, we can have. I just wanted to share a little bit about my journey and I thought it was really important that I shared my experience in terms of in context of the racism. I, for example, um, the lens through which I filter things is based on my background. So I'm originally from Nigeria. I really been schooled very internationally. And I came from a very, very traditional home um, where women knew their place and very strong Catholic background. And also very, 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 um, you know, my, all my family are very, very academic and also come from a very faith background. And I share that because that has really impacted the way I actually view um, things in, in the UK. So my experience from childhood coming to the UK at 12 was very positive because I was very I was embraced into the society. And actually my parents were um, born at a time where um, um, Britain colonized Nigeria. And they had really, really positive experience about that. So they, that was one of the reasons why they sent us over to the UK and not the United States, because um, my mom's headmistress was a white nun and she had a very, very all good things to say about her. So my, my filter, my memories of what it was to come to the UK was all very positive in many, many ways. And, you know, that was more solidified by experiences over the years. But just to share over the years, I, so therefore when some of my colleagues um, of ethnic minority would share some of their negative experiences, um, I couldn't quite relate. And that's just my experience. And I believe when I'm reflecting more deeply into it, it's probably because I had a very, very positive experience and that was reinforced by my parents and what their experience had been. But as I went on, in my more clinically and senior leadership, I started to experience it um, where I felt um, some remarks were made which weren't very pleasant, but I didn't attribute it to that. I kind of made a reason for it because in my mind it couldn't be possible. But when I looked at it further, I realized um, that you know, there, was, there was more to it than I actually um, thought. So just thought it would be really good to share that um, my lens in this, in this, in this area has been um, affected by the context in which I grew up as well. But the reality is that it does exist. Um, racism does exist. Um, I'll just share some statistics that we have. 80% of companies fail to represent diversity in senior leadership. So there is definitely something going on there. And 15% 15 of the Bain staff report experiencing discrimination in the past 12 months at work in the NHS compared to 6.2% of the white staff. More than a third of um, Bain workers have been bullied, abused or singled out at work. And obviously we all probably heard the news lately. This is um, statistically been proven. 32% of COVID deaths have been the Bain, come from Bain communities. Obviously there's been lots of studies as to why and reasons and it's not nothing concrete or some there's some evidence but um this there is definitely some strong evidence to show that there is um institutionalized issues that are causing the the problem okay so i'm sure we all know it human nature and as i know uh, my my walk in the uk has been very positive and we all know that it's not racism isn't good but I just wanted to um, 
put forward a business case for it as well to encourage more people to really look into it. So two thirds of job seekers actually com consider companies diversity. So a lot of people are looking for a company that is diverse and inclusive. Employees of firms with diverse leadership teams um, actually are 45 times more likely to report a growth in a market share and 70% likely to report that a firm captured a new market. 70%, so that's quite high. Inclusive workplace cultures are two times more likely to exceed their financial targets. Companies in a top quarter for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have financial returns above competitors. So it actually serves as a competitive advantage. So there's, there's definitely a strong human bit, but I'm just trying to say that beyond anything, there is also a, bit of a strong business case for it as well. And this is just a really great report if you want to look into it further. Um, the McKenzie report, why diversity matters, and just um, companies that are more diverse do better in, in many fronts. So this is just the a graph to show you that. What am I doing for time? Okay, I better have. So the takeaway, more dive, my, um, diverse companies we believe are better able to win top talent and improve their customer orientation, employee satisfaction and decision making. And all that leads to a cycle of increased returns. Okay, so what are some of the solutions? I'm going to, in a minute, go ahead and pass on to Fatima, who will just dive deep into this. But just, just some takeaways. Solutions to it, become more aware, learn about your bias. I, all of us have some degree of bias. And I think it's just being open-minded to look and see, okay, where am I being biased? Building key skills, which Fatima will touch on, work across boundaries, which also she'll talk about, and become a champion. And therefore, that will all equate to getting better results. So even just asking yourself when I um, looking at your, your network, what kind of network of group of friends are you, do you have? Is it reflective of a diverse community? And that actually really will open your, your mind and eyes to see how different people work and relate with each other and their values and their beliefs. So I don't want to talk too much. There's also an, um, uh, coaching really helps. And one of the reasons why I would encourage coaching is because it helps you change the narratives that you've built, right? Because you've probably, a lot of us have stories around different, um, different topics, different groups, different beliefs. And sometimes you're, because it's such, it's so ingrained in you, you don't realize it's a story or a narrative that you've created for yourself. So addressing your limited beliefs and limiting decisions you've made. Join a group like, like this, a diverse group of people, and really engaging in this group will also help you a great deal. So that's it for me. Um, I'm aware that time has gone, but thank you very much for li listening. You can always um, obviously reach out to me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and my email address is there. And I'll pull that up at the end, but thank you very much. And I will hand over to Fatima who will go dive deep. Fatima is actually a business consultant. Um, and she's done a lot of work. Um, um, she's done a lot of work in terms of diversity in organizations and she will just talk a little bit more on this issue and actual solutions, things you can actually do in your everyday life to become more inclusive. Okay. Thanks, thanks very much, Amon. Thanks, Ali, for... Uh, for the introduction, I will um, sh share my slides. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. And um, so thank you so much for, for joining this evening and thank you for, for having me in this interesting uh, seminar series. What I'm going to talk about uh, this evening is, is allyship and really build on the introduction that uh, that Oma gave us. So I'll, I'll give an introduction and situate, um, situate race allyship in context. So what, uh, what is an ally? So an ally is someone who belongs to a dominant social group um, and through their, through their support and through their actions, they, they work to eradicate prejudice. 
Now, allies are people who go beyond just not engaging in racist conversations and racist behaviours. Allies are proactive in challenging those behaviours. So this is, um, this is a definition that, that I use. Allies are uh, acknowledging and acting on the genuine belief that achieving racial and ethnic equality is not the responsibility of min minority ethnic people in our communities. Now, I know that in the workplace in the UK, um, our white colleagues are, are in the majority, but of course, when we leave work and in the social circles that we're in, um, even if we're in an ethnic minority communities, we become the majority. And many of us will experience in our own communities examples of racism. So what I want to talk about this evening is how we can be proactive allies in challenging those, those racist uh, comments and sentiments. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, talk you through 10 steps, 10 practical actions that you can, you can do to, to become an anti-racist ally, whether in the workplace or in your, your social life as well. So the first step uh, towards uh, being an anti-racist proactive ally is acknowledging personal privilege and disadvantage. In order to, um, to see our own personal privileges, we need to fight what we call our own self-serving bias. Mm -hmm. Now this bias is the attribution bias that Omo just talked about. We have a tendency, our default position when we succeed is to attribute that success to ourselves to say, you know, I, I'm successful because of my disposition, because of my skills and ability. And when we fail, we say it was the context, it was the situation. I got a bad mark because my lecturer set questions that are that weren't the content that he lectured in for it or she lectured in, for example. On the flip side of that, we also um, default to what we call the fundamental attribution error. Now, this is the reverse. This is when someone else succeeds we're much more likely to attribute their success to the context or situation, especially when they're in an, what we consider an outgroup. And when others fail, we're much more likely to attribute it to their disposition. And what this does is it makes it harder for us to see our own privileges, the identities that we have that have not necessarily helped us, but certainly not hindered us. But when we start to challenge our own self-serving bias and that fundamental attribution error, we start to see that some of the racial disparities, some of the data that Omo pointed to, is most likely or much more likely to be um, due to disadvantages and privileges as opposed to individuals and, and to groups. Mm -hmm. So um, step number two, learning that uh, racial inequalities are systemic. So one of the reasons that we often assume that racism is in the past, that people are no longer racist, is because we're much more likely to see its effects than to experience it or witness it overtly. So we're much more likely to see the statistics that Omar shared than to, for example, uh, experience someone uh, racially abusing someone else. Uh, a few days ago, I was on Twitter and I came across um, a thread written by Michael Mackley, who is a third year medical student in, in Canada. He said that, he, sh he, he shared this thread, pub uh, thread publicly and I welcome you to, to go and have a look at it. It was really interesting, his own experience of, of witnessing systemic racism. He said that he received patient notes that, this, that a patient had, uh, had liver disease and he wanted to look at the physical manifestation of this liver disease. So he jumps onto Google, he Googles it, he, he sets off thinking, yep, I know what this looks like. And when he gets to his patient and he opens the curtain, he sees that his patient is, is black. And he says that he fell, into his, he fell into the trap of his own privilege, assuming that his patient would look like him. Mm. And it made him realize that the textbooks that he'd read, the Google search, all of the images that he saw of this showed the physical manifestation of liver disease on white skin. He went on to say that the interaction highlighted for him the challenges faced by black Asian minority ethnic uh, people using a healthcare system that was designed for white people or white skin, for example. And so when we start to see in these systems that, what, that they're set up with white, for example, as the default position, we can understand that these disparities are the, the product of the system as opposed to, to differences. Another example of um, systemic racism is the um, 
the more and more we're seeing this face recognition technology and research shows that it's much more likely to recognize white faces than it is to recognize black faces. Just some examples of systemic racism that we see. Okay. So step number three, fighting our inner color blindness. Now talking about race is uncomfortable. It makes us uh, quite, can be quite defensive. And therefore, it's much easier for us to say, I don't see color, I, I only see people. You know, we don't need to talk about race and ethnicity in the workplace. It just divides us further. But actually, as Emma pointed to earlier, our subconscious, our, our unconscious biases, if we don't take control and we don't say, uh, consciously acknowledge other people's race in our everyday interactions, we allow our subconscious and our unconscious to take over our decision making. So research shows that within seven seconds of meeting someone, we've, we've judged that person. And if we don't consciously acknowledge racial differences, whether we're in the minority or, or majority, we're much more likely to let our stereotypes play into that interaction mm. and much less likely for the quality of the relationship to determine our evaluations or our judgments. And so by consciously acknowledging race in our thoughts, and acknowledging that that might play a part in the, the assumptions that we're making about that person, we can start to take control of how we, how we judge other people and how we treat other people. So number four, recognizing that uh, talking about race elicits different emotions. We all like to think of ourselves as good people. And so when we, um, we are faced with uh, racial inequality or an example, of racial inequality our first thought is i'm not racist you know we become quite defensive we want to defend ourselves if someone in our in-group for example has been accused of, of being racist we often want to say no not us we're not that person mm -hmm. and actually that that defensiveness can can manifest in a range of emotions we may feel embarrassment we might feel sh shame or guilt or frustration or d denial and actually in that instance we're much more likely to make that situation about ourselves mm. rather than stepping back and acknowledging that it's not about us. It's about that person's experience, that person's um, example. And so when confronted with examples of racial injustice, we should take the time to listen. We should take the time to process the information that we're receiving, acknowledge that someone's had a different experience to us and that's okay. And try and empathize with that experience. And what happens when we manage the emotions that we, we experience when we talk about race is that we're much more likely to, you know, reduce our defensiveness and to engage with that experience and to acknowledge it and to learn from it. So by reducing our emotions, we can learn from other people's experiences. So step, uh, step number five, thinking intersectionally. So uh, what is intersectionality? In short, intersectionality is realizing or acknowledging that people belong to multiple social categories and social groups, and that these social groups are um, overlapping. They're not distinct and they're not separate. For example, I am a, uh, I'm not a woman or a Muslim, I'm a Muslim woman all of the time in every experience and every situation. And so without considering intersectionality, without considering the overlap of people's identities, we fall into the trap of assuming that there's a prototype for each protected characteristic. Mm. So as a, a, a reflection, I welcome to think about, you know, what's my default prototype for women or for BAME, for Black, Asian, minority, ethnic people? What comes to mind when I think of those groups? Research has shown that um, gender diversity and inclusion initiatives are much more likely to benefit white women than ethnic minority women and that ethnic uh, minority interventions are or initiatives are much more likely to benefit BAME men than BAME women. When we start to think intersex intersectionally we can appreciate the nuances in people's experiences so we stop blanketing, we stop stereotyping, we allow space for diversity within different groups. So point number six, communicating mindfully. When we start to talk about uh, race and racial inequality, we can uh, be quite motivated to have these conversations. 
but sometimes there can be a gap between our intention and between the, the outcome and sometimes that gap can manifest as what we call a microaggression so it's not necessarily having a, the intention but it's actually l landing with in an offensive way so if we take the example um, on the slide you may have received a colleague's work this colleague may be a black female for example and you think what a fantastic phenomenal piece of work this person's done and your response, your verbal response is, wow, she speaks English well. Actually, what that, what that sentiment and what that statement does is it suggests that racial and ethnic minorities are outsiders, that they don't belong or that you expect them not to speak English as well as, as white people do. In reality, the majority of, of ethnic minority people in, uh, in the UK will speak English as a first language. Mm -hmm. So what do we do about that? What do we do to communicate mindfully? Focus on the content of people's work. If one of your colleagues has produced a phenomenal piece of work, say what a phenomenal piece of work. Try and avoid speaking to, uh, to, to the different characteristics that have challenged your assumptions. In addition to that, we often fall into the trap of assuming that all of our you know, our friends who are from a different minority ethnic group, for example, want to speak about their experiences. And in our eagerness to learn, we can sometimes put pressure on them to, to talk about their experiences. But it's important for us to remember that it's not other people's responsibility to educate us. Mm. And this is not just for our white colleagues who are interested in the heritage of our ethnic minority colleagues. It's also for, for us within different ethnic minority communities. Just because we consider ourselves to be ethnic minorities doesn't mean we appreciate all ethnic minorities experiences. Um, and we shouldn't expect other people to educate us on that. So um, point, point number seven, uh, developing race fluency. Uh, now this is a definition uh, by my colleague, Dr. Doyen Atawulligan. She says uh, the race fluency is defined as the degree of confidence and proficiency in understanding and articulating differences in experiences and career outcomes of employees of different ethnic backgrounds. Now, her research shows that people are much more likely to talk fluently about gender. To, you know, business leaders can reel off gender statistics much more confidently than they can with race and ethnicity. And when they talk about race and ethnicity, they're much more likely to hesitate, use broad brush comments, and to potentially skirt around issues. One of the challenges of talking about race is that race language is always changing. So depending on what area, area you are in in the country, depending where you are in the world, or depending on what sector you're in, for example, the language that we use to talk about race and ethnicity changes. So to become race fluent is not to be able to reel off all of the terminology but it's about understanding the history of that terminology. It's about understanding why certain terms are appropriate or inappropriate, why pe some people might not endorse words and others might, you know, might not. And so to become race fluent is to be able to justify the language you're using to talk confidently about race and to accept if someone's challenges that they don't use that language, to accept that um, with good intention and move on. We wrote a blog about race fluency, which uh, I'll point to the website at the end of my talk and you can read more about um, the blog we wrote in response to this is a response to COVID-19 and the disproportionate impact on uh, black Asian minority ethnic communities. So I've talked so far and um, I've talked a lot about um, what you can do to learn um, and to empathize with other people's experiences. But actually, uh, when it comes to proactive allyship, it's important for us to build a personal case, to ask ourselves, why, why does this matter to me? I mentioned earlier that we have an innate drive to think of ourselves in a positive way and for other people to think of us positively. And so asking ourselves what role we may have played in, in making biased decisions, for example, or upholding um, a system of inequality is very difficult for us to do. And um, there's, a, there's a quote I really like by the uh, American educator Lisa Delpit, who says it's painful because it means turning yourself inside out, giving up your own sense of who you are, 
and being willing to see yourself in the unflattering light of another's angry gaze. If we could really quantify and determine the impact that we'd had on upholding an, a system of inequality, how motivated would we be to, to change that system and to change and reduce our impact? Some of you are likely will be in leadership positions. You may want to be a role model. You may want to be a leader who provides a psychologically safe space for your staff to come forward and say, I've had an experience of racism. I want to share this with you. Some of you may be like uh, Michael Mackney and say, I want to make sure that I don't have a disproportionate impact on, on my patients. But it's important to think about what's my personal case? Why am I motivated to be a proactive and upstanding ally? And once we have our um, personal case, we can start to identify our impact. We can think, what part can I play in shaping the world as I would like to see it? We can't change the world on our own, but each of us has access to a different group of people, whether that be our children, our parents, or our friends outside of work. In the workplace, we might be in leadership positions. We might be invited guest speakers. We might be part of a network that's not the race and ethnicity network. Identifying our impact isn't about saying, I'm going to quit my day job, I'm now becoming an activist. It's about knowing in your everyday situations and everyday encounters, what can you do to bring, bring to light some of these issues? Where can you have the most impact? So I just welcome you to uh, reflect and think, what do, what do I have access to in terms of education, in terms of power, am I in a leadership position? Can I change things from within? And the platform, how many people can you reach? Where can you bring this conversation in? And when we start to identify our personal impact, that's when we can see where we as individuals can make the most change in our day-to-day -day lives. Okay, and, and finally, the final step, uh, becoming a disruptor. Now, if everybody became an anti-racist disruptor at the micro level, we would be less likely to see the effects of code discrimination at the macro level. So what I've done here is just provide um, some strategies for disrupting everyday microaggressions that we might see. Now, disrupting microaggressions isn't an easy thing to do, but the more we, um, the more we acknowledge our privilege, for example, the more race fluent we become, the, the easier it becomes to disrupt these microaggressions. And the more of us do it, the, more, the easier it becomes because we have uh, people doing it alongside us as well. So as I said earlier, most, of the, most people who perpetrate a microaggression are not doing it intentionally. And so there are strategies we can use to engage with these people to, um, to disarm that microaggression and to educate the, uh, the perpetrator of that microaggression. So the first step is making the invisible visible. Many people who, you know, per uh, perpetrate microaggressions don't know they've done this. So raise awareness of the microaggression by challenging the stereotype that they've, they've relied on. Ask for clarification on the statement they've made. And this validates the person that they've targeted that communication at. This validates their experience. It says, you know, it's okay for you to have feel upset or annoyed by this comment. Uh, the second strategy is to disarm the microaggression. Encourage the individual who's, who's made that comment to reflect, reconsider uh, what they've said, state your values, communicate your disagreement and why you disagree with the statement that they've made. This will allow the person who said it to, to think before they speak, to un understand that, in, that gap between the, their intention and the outcome. The third step is to educate the offender, facilitate a constructive conversation with them, ask them to, um, you know, to, to open up why, where did that assumption or stereotype that they have, where did that come from? Promote empathy and that will lower the defensiveness of that individual. Understand where they're coming from and use that as an opportunity for a constructive conversation. Mm -hmm. And then finally seek external reinforcement. Being a proactive ally is not, um, and not an easy thing to do. It's very easy to be not racist and not engage in those conversations. It's more challenging to stand up, to be an upstanding proactive ally and to disarm microaggressions. So make sure that you're maintaining your own psychological wellness. 
seek out support, seek out people who hold the, the values that you hold, who want to also be proactive allies as well and create a community around that. So here I just wanted to um, summarize the, the 10 steps uh, towards allyship. This, uh, in the bottom left corner, you'll see that um, there's a link to the, the blog with these steps on our website. Um, I just wanted to summarize them, them here for you and give you a second to reflect on them. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, so much. I'll hand back over now. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, do you want to take over? I was going to say thank you to both um, Armo and, and everyone for sort of sharing their thoughts and experiences. This is obviously a very sensitive topic. You know, I saw this patient in the emergency department three weeks ago. She was a 70 year old lady. She come over to the UK from Jamaica. And she presented with some respiratory problems. But she was telling me about um, giving her experiences of the pandemic and hiding away. And, but one of the things I remember she was telling me about is how much she feels we've come as a society over the last 50 years. So there are clearly problems at the moment and you know you we've articulated them clearly it's about how we move on from here and it's very difficult for someone like myself to i guess be able to fully empathize unless you've actually walked in the in the shoes of someone who's actually faced discrimination because of a racist or ethnic background i can only imagine it's terrible i know when i feel i've been unfairly treated for any reason it's it's a really horrible feeling so to think that that would occur because of you know um, my ethnicity uh, would be terrible. So, but I do know solutions to these problems involve inclusion, uh, and we want to create a more inclusive society. And there are many people out there with very um, impassioned views on both sides of the argument. Some people have the empathetic understanding, and others don't. So I really put it out there for people to share their experiences of maybe discrimination they've faced and potential solutions that they think are workable in their work context. I'd be interested to hear mainly from a learning perspective of myself. I think starting to rely, realize our own prejudice within our own ethnic minority community, similar to assuming that the surgeon would be a male extreme instances on being politically correct prevents frank discussion while in emphasizing inequality e equality we also do need to accept natural differences Fatima what is your thoughts on that mm -hmm. absolutely so um thanks Omo um just before this call Ali and I had a conversation about um the, the racism within our own communities as as well um, of course, there are cross-cultural differences in the stereotypes that we have um, and the stereotypes that we, we rely on. Um, so I, com I completely agree with the point. point. Um, this isn't the responsibility just of our white colleagues to pay attention to, but also an opportunity for us to reflect on our own selves and our own communities um, as well. And I think part of um, one of the reasons I love coaching is a lot of times when you bring things to awareness then you can start making changes but the the one of the things that cause people to remain stuck is when it, you're not aware so following this talk maybe just being more aware even one of the things i said is looking around your network um, of friends um, i'm really blessed i have friends from really around the world so i'm really really blessed from different cultures different faiths and I purposely done that in my life, but maybe it's because I went to an international school, so it was natural for me to do that. But you'll be so surprised that you probably stick to the people that are within the same, your same background, your same education. And there's a way that you all think. And I think being aware that that's, that's your lens in which you look through things. So maybe expanding your network group, um, 
specifically at work, maybe just having conversations with different people and letting them share their own experiences and just chat and the way they talk. Um, so yeah, I think that's really important. Becoming aware actually allows you to make positive changes, to make, take action. Okay. We've got a question from Amit Vasachi. Uh, Mr. Vasachi, could you please unmute yourself? It'd be lovely to hear from you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for such a highly informative and uh, very insightful presentation. Basically, I've grown up in Glasgow and I like to believe in a Muslim background and um, I like to believe I take a broad view and uh, I try to allay any bias I may have because obviously I've been a victim of racism as a Asian person growing up in a predominantly white school. Mm. But when I found that um, when num the point number 10 that um, Fatima was making where I try to become a disruptor, it seems to have a, a knock on a back effect on me as maybe someone who's well who are you to judge and why are you saying this I'm not a racist or someone may say I don't have this bias where I perhaps was seeking to help the person in understanding that they perhaps are showing a form of bias or racism towards someone else so mm -hmm. it's quite difficult to balance the role of being a disruptor but also being impartial and empathic so i was basically making that point to fatima thanks so much for your your point and absolutely i, I completely ag agree i know my my colleague joan will have something to say about this potentially um well, the research shows that when you're looking at di um, disarming microaggressions unfortunately it's people are less defensive and there's more power in it coming from a majority group member than a minority. So typically when people, um, you know, ha they engage in these microaggressions, um, they're much more, much more likely to be disarmed by a member of their own group telling them why they think that's wrong than by someone who the target of their microaggression telling them that's wrong. So we often see that, that, that notion of chip on the shoulder and, and that yeah. kind of thing. And therefore, um, my, my point four about you know protecting your own well-being when when necessary going to seek psychological support and psychological help um, for that because it's a very difficult position to be in to try and educate someone when they as Omar said they haven't got that level of awareness yet so I completely agree with you mate it's very difficult to disarm a microaggression when you are the target of that and that microaggression which is w one of the main reasons why we need allyship from our um, white majority colleagues as well, because mm. that in itself provides some power to disarm that aggression. Mm. Fatima, I have a question for you. Um, there have been comments coming in about inherent, if you like, structures in society that make racism endemic, that make racism institutional. And we have heard the word institutional racism I think racism in the context that we've all been discussing is about the work context, not so much about being shouted on the street. So what suggestions would you have for the audience here about how they can overcome those barriers? Because it has to work at two levels. It's not just about us changing society, us changing organizational norms, but we've got to find a way to navigate through and succeed. I mean, Barack Obama did. Yeah, absolutely. And you often find that, um, that there's, there's that one example of someone did it, so we should all be able to do it. But those institutional barriers um, still still persist. Something that Omo said that, that struck me was, um, was building qu good quality relationships across difference. Now, one of the things that could do rather than, you know, directly speaking to our white majority colleagues about being allies, building those strong quality relationships will reduce people's prejudice. Um, so research shows, for example, when we think of contact theory, if uh, a member of a majority group has a positive experience with one member of a minority group, they're much more likely to um, 
generalize that positive experience to to all my all members of that minority group mm -hmm. and so um, my recommendation would be to build strong quality uh, good quality relationships um, across different um, I know uh, my colleague join is, is on the call I don't know if she wants to come off mute and add something to that because mm -hmm. she's um, um, well experienced in in supporting minority ethnic professionals um, through navigating these kind of institutional barriers it would be a massive privilege if Professor Doyen did come in, because I mean, Professor Doyen is an author of a report commissioned by the GMC into endemic discrimination with healthcare. Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, Doyen. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I, Apologies. I, There's some printing in the back. There's some printing in the background, so apologies, but please go ahead, Omar. Thank you so, so much. So I just want to introduce Zoe. She's actually a dean of um, um, Oxford University, so I'm really, and she does a lot of extensive works with organizations, so I'm really, really excited that she could join us here. So, yeah. So please tell us, Professor Doyen, how could we empower ourselves those institutional barriers? Well, but Fatima and you know the session that Omar had beforehand, I think, have covered a, a lot of the really useful content. Um, it, it is a challenge. But the core challenge is that um, as um, a minority individual, regardless of the minority identity, implicit in that is the is you know unfortunately just to say it explicitly is a, a a lower level in hierarchy a lower level in power a lower level of resources a lower level of capital all sorts of things so there are many many uh, like you know factual reasons that it is a um, a greater challenge for it just to be that individual to um, transcend um, regardless of the, um, the structural barriers. So whereas we understand from a psychological perspective, the need to have agency, i.e. the need to say, regardless of all of this, I can do it. So we understand that, but I think it's very important for us to also understand that actually at a structural systemic level, in order for the, the, um, the power dynamics to be changed, we, we need the majority on board. So I guess my first answer is, there might be something around actually understanding that I have a degree of agency, but it is limited. And therefore, to what extent am I going to get resources, access, capital support? Um, not because I am less than, but because the system that I have found myself in, that I have been placed in, not because of anything to do with me, has been, um, you know, it's been constructed and here I am. So there's something about noting it and looking for options. And I mm. want to reiterate Fatima's point around self-care, kind of deciding which game you want to play. So when we work with minority ethnic talent, we say things like there's something about understanding the game, you know, understanding the game, the rules, this is how it works, this is how feedback happens, this is how stereotyping happens, this is what bias is, this is how um, networking happens. And then once you know the rules, then you opt in or opt out. And that's where the agency happens. So, Ali, I think in, in, uh, uh, just to close up, the, the answer to the question is, in order to transcend, after you acknowledge, understand, and make the choice about managing your energies with regards to what you want to pay attention to and what you don't want to in the short term, while in the long term, we all work towards appending these inequalities. Thank you. Thanks for the session. Thank you for the invitation. Great <laughs> session. Thank you so much to everyone. I wonder if anybody had any questions because uh, the session will be closing very soon. If you do, please raise your hand. Matt, do you have anything to add? Well, you're on mute. Yeah. So I guess everyone... I say I've enjoyed listening. Bobo. Um... I don't know how to raise my hand, I'm sorry, but may I ask a question, please? please. Um, it's a question for Doyen, if she doesn't mind answering it. Um, as Dean of the Rhodes Scholarships, how do you feel about Rhodes Must Fall campaign that's got so much press here in Oxford? 
So, um, <clears throat> pertinent question, Sally, and to give everyone a little bit of history, um, I'm Dean of the Rhodes Scholarships, um, like Sally has said, and the Rhodes Scholarships were set up by Cecil Rhodes, who lived, um, uh, who, uh, the, the scholarships were set up about 100 years ago, just over 100 years ago. Um, and they were set up when he was, uh, when he set them up, uh, well, you know, he kind of um, endowed, uh, he put it in his will that he wanted money to be um, com committed to a selection of people, mostly white men from Europe and the US, to, because he, to come to Oxford, because his vision was that that was the kind of person who had the entitlement and the capacity to um, rule the world, more or less. So that's the history. And Sally's question is a very pertinent question, which is how particularly is me as a kind of black woman, Nigerian, like how do I reconcile that? Which is very different to the conversations that we're having so far. But I think, you know, in the spirit of all of us grappling with um, you know, what does Black Lives Matter mean to us? What does um, Rose Must Fall mean to us? What does uh, COVID affecting um, a group of people, um, you know, uh, uh, who have particular qualities, for example, Black, Asian, minority ethnicities, um, you know, affecting them more than other people? You know, I think this is a pertinent question for all of us. The answer for me, and to be explicit, I am speaking on my behalf. So I would um, if you are recording, please do not take my words out of context. If you're going to repeat me, please do not take my words out of context. Uh, please check with me before you do anything with what I'm about to say. So really, you know, just to say that very explicitly, you know, I'm saying this in the spirit of what, how are we all making sense of this. But I don't think what I'm going to say is controversial. Um, what I love about the current Road Scholars is it subverts Sissel's Cecil Rhodes' initial vision. The money that he um, invested in, oh, I'm sorry, the money that he put in the will comes from the blood and the sweat of African miners. So I feel actually quite privileged, empowered, you know, not privileged as in lucky, privileged as in now this is the time. Now this is the time to repurpose the, um, the, you know, so there were aspects of the vision in terms of actually get a group of people to be global leaders that um, remain in terms of the spirit of the current scholarships. And we do that so well. We are, so right now the scholars are diverse. It's like 20% uh, from um, black communities. They are making our, uh, we're possibly a little too left, possibly left leaning. Um, we are making phenomenal changes in terms of impact in society, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it was a bit of a long response, but, you know, I thought, you know, to, to um, acknowledge uh, Sally's question and, and in the spirit of the space, uh, respond to it. Can I just say, um, as someone at Oxford University, I am so delighted that a black woman is the Dean of the Rhodes Scholarships. It absolutely has made my day to discover that you've been appointed. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sally. That's so great. We had some really good remarks uh, from, it was Meryl, who talked about, who talks about watching the documentary 13th recently and thought it did an excellent job explaining how racism has been built into the laws and systems in the US. Has anyone seen it? Is it very much the same in the UK? Um, Omo, Fatima, Doen, do you have any answers to that? I haven't, I haven't seen that, that movie. <laughs> Sorry, Omo. No, have I seen it. But I would say, I think there is a lot of, um, structures in place that continue to perpetuate it. There's, it's, it's very, very, as we've probably alluded to, it is very much there. So I would imagine, I, don't, I haven't commented about that particular movie, um, so I don't know about it, but I know that there is structural things in place that continue to encourage racism, inequality. Um, it's actually been very good seeing issues such as allyship, or so issues such as racism and allyship being tied together. Um, 
it's like change. It's like a change process. You have a shared vision of how do you overcome the institutional barriers. You find a coalition. That's where your allies come in. And then you co-create change and you make that difference. So could that be a fair sort of analogy where we can, as a collective, promote, if you like, self-empowerment through that process mm. by finding allies. Finding allies across the spectrum, not just within your own color spectrum, color bandwidth. Mm -hmm. well, thank Absolutely, Ali, I completely agree. Thank you so much for everyone turning up and engaging. I, I think I'm just going to leave Ali to close out. And if anyone wants to stay further beyond seven, please feel free and you can message us. We're going to hang out for about another 15 minutes. I just want to also encourage you to please kindly fill out the survey monkey. That'd be great if you could do that. It would give us some more insight on what topics to bring on to this um, forum, to this platform. And yes, I'm going to hand over to Ali just to tell us what the next session is. But thank you so much. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Fatima, for really, really being here to share so much insight. It's been really amazing. Thanks, Omar. Thanks, um Ali. It is absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, Fatima, Doyen, Omo. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming on. I have to say that it has been 12 sessions continuously, and uh, the 12 sessions saw us through pretty much the lockdown. Now, the lockdown is drawing to a close. We're heading towards the recovery. I suppose our focus in life is going to change back to work and more work. But, of course, we shall be with you. Uh, to focus on issues relating to the recovery, about how we should be uh, finding ourselves in the new normal and delivering what makes that difference. Now, thank you very much all. Bye-bye.